me a very warm welcome to Monash University into our brand new building and our facilities, which we're very keen to show off. Welcome teachers, educators, alumni, students and friends. Thank you very much for attending the first of our 2018 Engaging STEM Education Lecture Series for, for this year. We're very happy to be continuing on our Engaging STEM Lecture Series in addition to the talks we had last year and offering you the opportunity for extra support with STEM education and implementing it. When I think of STEM, I think of that really scary statistic that 40% of the jobs in the future haven't even been invented or created yet. And that for me says we have a bit of a dilemma because how do we prepare students and teachers for such an uncertain future? And this is where these sorts of seminars help us to keep the conversation going and thinking about what this means for us as educators in practice. We're very, very pleased to offer you four lectures for this particular year. We're kicking off with the Makerspace as a stimulus for thinking about how we might start to develop capabilities and literacies through STEM. Our second seminar in May is going to make it personal and social, thinking about how we can develop those capabilities. In August, we'll be looking at intercultural, uh, intercultural understandings and how STEM offers an opportunity to develop those. And we'll finish in December with my personal favourite, critical and creative thinking. So without, um, no, without further ado, I'll hand over to Roland for starting our first seminar for this year. Welcome ladies and gentlemen, visitors to Monash University, Faculty of Education. I wish to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations whose land we're gathered today and I pay my respect to their elders, past and present. Just, just hold that for a moment. Because we often hear that phrase being read out and um, I want you to remember that 40 to 60,000 years of Aboriginal occupation have actually lived on this land and given fought to also 2,000 generations. They have a deep and intimate understanding of the country that we stand upon. And I want you to put that into context and give some respectful thought to the campfires that they lit on this land and the stories that they shared. And the one million sunsets that they watched See, we've always been engaged in solving real world problems. And what's new is the more recent digital influences that STEM allows us to amplify our ideas and explore new original solutions. This is new territory and it's a new beach for us to walk upon. Two years ago, a good friend, Leonie McGlashan, she approached me about creating an online community for STEM educators. And at the same time, there was a group called Magnet that I was involved with, which was moving to an online environment with promoting its community work. And I recall that my stand back then was that we want to create a meeting place, not just using an email list, but using an online group. It was a Facebook group, and I suggested a metaphor of a campfire where we could sit around, swap and share ideas. And so we designed this online community where everyone could bring their own stone to sit upon. And we could sit around the campfire and discuss a STEM education narrative. The community started with just two and has now grown over two years to 1,500 people. Yeah, very quick. There's Gary here. Now he might still be outside. Now, Gary, how many people are we getting each day, Gary? Uh, each week's about 50. And it's scary to think about the number of educators that are seeing this as being a really important imperative and how we can serve that interest. But because we've had now 1,000 nights to actually work hard to generate that community, we've been reflecting about where we're coming from and about where we're going. So this presentation is going to capture the strong connections of the maker community with STEM education and explore its digital origins. Now the catchphrase is make it so. Who's heard of it before? Yeah, where have you heard it? Yeah. 
Star Trek, yeah, I suppose so. Captain Jean-Luc Picard. It's actually not something that was invented by Star Trek. It's actually a British naval term. And it's used often for officers to describe something that they need to have done. So let me get on with this task. I have um, Renee, who's going to be looking forward at the STEM careers and the emerging technologies and cyber. I have Donna, and Donna's going to be looking back at the digital origins of STEM, the freedom, liberation. I also have Harva, who's going to be looking around us today, a journey that Tick took from being a scientist to a STEM educator. I have Georgine, who's going to be looking outward at how we can unleash STEM for humanity. And lastly, I've got uh, Robert, who's going to help me synthesise looking inward at STEM education and these threads. Tonight, as we sit around our digital circle of stones, let's share our stories and leave behind some footprints. Sit at the campfire, weave our stories, and work together to leave this world a better place to live in. I'd like to introduce you first to Renee. Renee is currently Director of Education Engagement for Life Journey International. She has an extensive experience working in secondary schools, tertiary institutions, as well as teaching organisations. She holds several advisory roles for driving change and leadership for 21st century learning strategies, building strong partnerships and leveraging technologies for in digital futures. Renee, we're talking about STEM kills for the cyber generation. Thank you, Renee. Thank you. Thank you. Clicker. All right. <laughs> thank you. All right. I'll I'll just do that. Um, I did uh, thank welcome uh, today um, to to this particular group, this fantastic space. Um, I just wanted to. Can we go to the first uh, slide? Yes, we're talking today a little bit about uh, the futures and I, th I think it was mentioned just earlier before that if we then go to the second slide that um, my stats are 65% of primary school students uh, will not know at that particular point what job they're going to end up in because the job doesn't exist. And uh, the stats are also saying that 75% of jobs today are going to require all of these fantastic STEM skills that are being developed in students in schools today. So. Um, uh, all of this uh, background from where I come from, I'm working for um, a company, Life Journey, uh, is an online uh, platform. It's um, scalable mentorship online for students to get an insight into what the possibilities are uh, beyond uh, their school years. And it all connects in with this industry uh, four, because industry themselves are grappling with the way in which they're going to cope with autonomous vehicles, these new technologies of IoT, robotics and 3D printing, etc. So um, the careers recently, some of you might have seen the ABC program on Late Line, which was called the AI Race. And here um, there is a, a paralegal who is uh, competing against a Lyra, a piece of software. She comes into the room to uh, try and resolve a, a problem and a Lyra has solved it in 30 seconds. Uh, I'm not going to show it today because we don't have time, but it's there in the PowerPoint if you want to have that as a resource. It's absolutely fascinating. And then on the side there, you can see that just in the finance area that uh, uh, those percentages, which go down to about a third of those jobs, won't exist because they won't, it will be taken by a machine. Um, other things that are affecting the way in which we look at the, the future and our uh, beyond school are all of these new marketplaces and the new market models online. So we have familiar ones to us, I would suspect, in terms of Uber, um, Alibaba, um, Airbnb and, and Facebook and they have all made such a huge uh, difference in a very short period of time. Uh, some of the skills as we know that we need to sort of develop in our students and ourselves, we're um, just as important in teachers to develop those skills, are sitting 
around those life skills, literacy skills and, and learning skills and importantly around those soft skills. So industry are asking that we have a diversity of uh, people within the workplace working in teams and to have not only the expert knowledge or the domain knowledge but also these other skills that are going to be so important in solving problems in the future. So the power of a lot of our creativity, particularly um, in Industry 4.0, sits around the internet. We know that um, the internet and the ubiquity of the internet, but also STEM and the ubiquity of STEM is also going to be um, prevalent. And this slide here is because um, in that third industrial revolution, uh, we had um, man go to the moon in 1969, and that SAMHSA um, uh, phone has more technology in it than took man in the moon in 1969. And so technology is going so quickly. So here, um, in terms of innovation, the question is, what will be innovation in 2030 with things coming so quickly when there's going to be 21 billion of these IOTs, Internet of Things, things that are connected to the internet to make our lives a lot more efficient, enjoyable, etc. Um, what are those things that are going to be there and what are our, our students and our children going to be thinking about um, as their career paths? And another key thing, obviously, is integrity around a lot of that information that's on the internet, integrity of data, of people, of systems. So we need that trust. So we need that the ethical side of things and sustainability of a lot of these resources uh, require um, that trust, that if we put that credit card in our in the ATM that we know that um, all of our details aren't going to be swiped. Um, and so we, we've heard all of these uh, before, so get the next. Just uh, in terms of some of the education strategies, I work across Australia. So working with, say, the New South Wales Department, you can see that they're looking at the implications of AI and automata... Or, or, oh, sorry, I've got that uh, word a bit mixed. Um, uh, and uh, also in WA with the WA STEM Consortium. They're starting to bring these partnerships between industry, uh, education uh, and, and government together to work together towards uh, these challenges that we have. Uh, and some of the uh, Commonwealth uh, initiatives there under the National STEM Education Strategy um, that came out in December and will be completed uh, this, this year. So I've just put those resources up there because that gives you good uh, thinking about how we make that change in our classrooms and towards our, um, our teaching and learning. Right, the day of STEM is, uh, as I said, um, all this information is about um, the way in which we're thinking about the day of STEM. It's an online platform, accessed anywhere, anytime. It's free and it provides a strategy to inspire students about their work futures. Uh, there was a recent um, survey by seek.com of, of students asking them what did they want to be when they grew up. Many of them didn't have technology in their background. They had, I want to be a, uh, uh, an astronaut, I want to be, but it didn't connect with the technology that was surrounding them. So part of the, the day of STEM's aim is to sort of give that insight into what some of these jobs might be. So it's an Australian initiative, uh, uniquely Australian, and, um, and it's designed to build that awareness and to inspire the next generation. We call the cyber generation because of the use of the, um, of the internet. And it's free and self-guided and um, it uh, has eight unique uh, theme, or eight themes um, which we're currently working on. And it's very hard to, for students now to go into the workforce and be productive when there is so many uh, complications within uh, some of the things that they're, they're doing. Uh, it's not a case of the students going in and helping make the cup of tea and sweep the floor and possibly doing some, some, some work. So this uh, is another way of sort of giving students an insight into what those jobs might so up there you can see some of the, uh, the themes. The STEM Cup is around sports analytics. The um, Australia 2020 is about innovation and technology. Women's 
ecosystem obviously is very important for us that we have you know 50 percent of our planet that needs to also be involved um, in stem and and take on some leadership cyber security um, that one is meant to sort of try and break the well the stereotypes and the misconceptions around cyber security which is meant to be all about innovation and technology and the security of of of, of that um, it's not just about the hacker um, sitting behind a computer. There were all these stereotypes around ICT for a very long time. Um, now we have some of these stereotypes coming through um, in STEM um, and um, particularly in the area of cyber security. So it's again sort of trying to um, break uh, some of those um, misconceptions. Finance tech, Internet of Things, as I said before, 21 billion objects by 2020. That's a huge amount of innovation and um, knowledge and also it needs some form of um, security layer uh, with, with those as well as um, invention. Uh, the other one is medtech, so around that and sustainability. Uh, just in terms of some of the uh, partnerships that uh, part of this initiative. There are three tiers. So at the top we've got universities that are working with us at the moment, um, Macquarie, uh, La Trobe and, and Deakin. The middle tier are our supporters who provide our mentors for us across those eight themed areas. And uh, the bottom are our um, professional teaching associations and other associations uh, around STEM. Uh, the platform uh, can be done from a laptop, PC, uh, a device, so it can, and can be accessed anywhere, anytime, as I said before. Part of um, the program provides a personality and a career quiz so that the students that go in can give a comparison between the mentor and themselves. Um, they... Um, they go through journeys and they can select. They don't need to select everyone, um, but they might. They can explore anyone. So um, I'll just put this one here because this is a year 10's definition of um, a student um, who uh, was doing uh, cyber, where it's basically saying that um, understanding cyber science is 80% about um, human behaviour and 20% about the tech. So we have to know that it's interdisciplinary. So like STEM is interdisciplinary, so is, um, so is, is cyber. Um, we, we'll skip the, um, the video, seeing they're not working. Yeah. The video that was shown here was a situation in cyber, so the students um, decide that uh, they can make decisions about um, how to go ahead in a situation, so there are uh, extra activities within the program. The reason this is up here is um, because Minister Della Darkus, who is the Minister for Innovation here in Victoria, has put out a call to action to all schools um, to become more cyber. Uh, security aware and there's a competition happening at the moment. Um, and so it finishes on April 30th, people can still uh, get involved, so that's uh, schools and teachers and, um, and students and there is a Minister's Award and you can go to the website at dayofstem.com.au and you can see uh, that particular um, challenge uh, there. So uh, I might just leave it there at the moment, but the key message that I suppose I'm, I'm trying to get across today is that um, we do need to start to look at those uh, career-ready uh, skills and that having a more of a, a flexibility in terms of um, capabilities for our students to tackle um, our, new, our new world in which STEM, the internet and um, all of these uh, new innovations in technology will be at the forefront in their minds. Thank you. Thank you, Rollins. It was interesting hearing Renee talk about the jobs of the future and that we don't even know what they are. I've spent most of my career working in the web. The web didn't exist when I did VCE. So it's not something that's necessarily new and far off. It's already been happening. It changes fast. But as Roland said, I'm not talking to you about fast change in the future, but fast change in the past. 
So Digitise the Dawn. Um, this is a project that I, I started in 2011. I was actually preparing a talk on women in technology. And uh, for that talk, I wanted to look back into the past because my thesis was we are here, we have always been here. We have always been part of technology. And the wonderful Genevieve Bell, who um, is an Australian who has been a, an anthropologist at Intel for many years and has recently come back to Australia, did a fantastic talk about how women have always been key users of technology. They don't get the kudos and the glory that they may, that the, the makers of technology have had, but most of the innovation um, in, in technology that once it, it kind of makes its presence felt in the real world has come from users saying, hey, this is broken. This doesn't work. It would be better if it did that. And so acknowledging the role of women as users in technology is really important. And that's where that talk sort of came from. What I wanted to do was um, look into Louisa Lawson's um, journal, The Dawn, which she published in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And I'd heard about this wonderful thing called Trove, the National Archives um, newspaper digitising project. Who's heard of Trove? Some of you. You all need to go and find out about Trove. It's awesome. But anyway, The Dawn wasn't online. Um, I knew it was a sick normal, so. And so I, I found this will be a problem. And if it's not online these days, it's simply... It, it, it does not exist. So all of you who said that, thank you. So um, the... Yeah, I'm just going to ignore the slides. Don't worry about it. Um, so uh, I started a campaign to raise funds to have the Dawn digitised. Uh, we, we got the money, the National Library digitised the Dawn and a year later on International Women's Day 2012, it was um, available for free online for everyone. But why does this matter? So who, who knows who Louisa Lawson is or was? Who knows who Henry Lawson is or was? Few more people recognise Henry Lawson, Australian poet, the man for Snowy River. It's, no, that was Banjo Patterson. Anyway, Henry Lawson is a famous Australian poet. Sorry? The guy on the $10 note. Thank you. You all recognise the guy on the $10 note. Um, his mother was Louisa Lawson. She actually was his first publisher. She ran her own business. Um, entirely staffed by women um, who printed and published um, The Dawn and a bunch of other stuff. She was also an inventor. She has a patent uh, for a mailbag fastener. She really was um, a, you know, a, an innovative pioneer in information technology. Um, printing presses, mailbag fasteners, she was really all about you know, doing this stuff better than it was being done. And unfortunately, she doesn't really get the recognition she deserves. She also published The Dawn, which was um, a real pioneering um, uh, journal, which was part of the whole suffrage movement of women um, getting the vote. So I felt like it was important that this be online. I had wanted to look into it. It wasn't available, and now it is. This is her mailbag fastener pattern. How awesome is that, right? I just love that. So, um, what is this? How, do, how is this relevant to what we're talking about today? So we can just sort of fast forward randomly through these slides now. This is the story of my campaign, but I really want to um, focus more on why is this relevant. I think the, the role of women in technology is, is a key one. And if we're talking about science, technology, engineering and maths, they are all, women are woefully underrepresented in all of those areas and for not very good reasons, to be honest. I mean, lots of people have looked into some of the reasons and the barriers and really, if you ask me, they're all bogus and it's time we threw those away and just got on with it, right? We've just got to just call it out and make it change. And the only way that's going to happen is if we systemically do so. Um, the thing about this project in particular is it was all about using technology to tell the story. Um, I used Twitter, I had online payment methods, I connected with people through mailing lists um, online, I reached out through networks. Um, all of those things were possible when I did this. It may not have been possible, um, you know, 
20, 30 years ago. But tools like this one, which was chip in, I could quickly just pull up a campaign and start raising money. I ended up getting into quite a lot of trouble with PayPal, who thought I was doing something nefarious and flagged the counter terrorism. Anyway, I won't go into that, but it got a bit dicey there for a while. And the, the, National, um, the National Library actually had, had to kind of um, vouch for me and say, yeah, no, she's, she's doing this for us, honest, and please give her the money she's raised. Um, I, I, I built this website um, to talk about what we were doing, to um, highlight the stories, um, and to really uncover this piece of the past and preserve it for the future. Because often we talk about STEM and it is this very future-oriented thing, but it has always been part of Australia's kind of DNA, if you like. We've always been techn technological innovators. So we don't have to reach out far beyond who we are and what we've done. We just need to do more of it. And we need more of us involved in doing it. Digitise the Dawn is the Twitter account. It's now running a bot which polls Trove once a day and publishes a random article. STEM is not just about the about the future, it's also about the past and more importantly it's about the present and our engagement with it. And on that note I think I'll finish. My next speaker is uh, Harva Rodriguez and she's worked at several institutions including the Victorian Space Science Education Centre and we actually gave a presentation there uh, last year. The John Monash Science School, the Nibna Yahweh College, Deakin University and Monash University. She holds a graduate diploma in education and a Bachelor of Science majoring in Geosciences and Biology. She's passionate about paleontology. My daughter would be excited to hear that. Fantastic. A project, scenario based learning, as well as encouraging students to undertake STEM based careers. Shava Rodriguez from the Monash Tech School. Thank you. Thank you, Roland. Um, good afternoon or good evening, depending on whether you're going by the sunset or the hour. Um, my name is Java Rodriguez and I am the program teacher at the Monash Tech School. Um, I'm actually going to be uh, talking a little bit about my journey into becoming a STEM educator, um, starting off um, in just a plain science degree. So. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, slide, please. Um, so, um, as Roland mentioned, um, I am a scientist. I started off majoring in the geosciences and biology um, with a specific specialisation um, within paleontology and sedimentology. Um, as a young girl of five years old, um, it was my dream to become a paleontologist and Jurassic Park still is my number one favourite movie. Um, and one of the three favourite places I love to spend my time in is outside, in the field, looking for fossils, uh, in a lab, actually looking at them and trying to decide what they are, but also interacting with individuals and communicating science to them. So I've diversified my career options just from wanting to be a paleontologist from a young age um, into becoming an educator. And I've actually become really passionate about STEM education but also science communication and encouraging not only youngsters into learning about science but also trying to maintain curiosity across all ages within STEM. So my current path has taken me across many different workplaces so far and I started off my education journey at the Victorian Space Science Education Centre and that was when I really got the teaching bug. Um, I caught it somewhere on Mars, in the Martian surface there. And since then, I haven't looked back. Um, in 2014, I completed a Diploma of Education. Um, I decided we'll get that ticked off because I really wanted to give classroom teaching a try um, to see what it was really like and where was science education within the classroom sitting at at that point in time. And that led to me going to work at the John, John Monash Science School, um, 
doing substitute teaching and short-term contract work, but also being involved with the regional exchange program there. Um, and then last year I worked back at the school I actually originally graduated from here in Victoria, which was Lidl Yavna College, and that was a great experience to be back at my old school and seeing how things had changed there as well. Um, but also um, being able to reflect back when I was a student and how teaching was done back then and how things had changed now and what I was bringing to the classroom. Um, and during that time as well, before I went to back to Liebler Yavna College, I actually also finished my honours degree um, looking at uh, Mornington Peninsula fossil sites down there. Um, and that also actually led me to get a chance to do some demonstrating teaching at Deakin University with undergrad students. Um, and then mid last year, I started a position at the Monash Tech School, um, which is where I'm currently at. So if we could just go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So if you haven't heard of the Monash Tech School, um, Monash Tech School is one of 10 tech schools that have opened up or are opening up um, over the next year or so. Um, and they've started opening up since probably around a year and a half ago now. We are the second one that's currently in operation. And we are focusing um, in specific STEM areas that are aligned with industry groups here in the city of Monash, as well as research groups that are current, that are formed here at Monash University. So Monash University is actually our primary host. And um, the areas we're focusing on uh, within our STEM area are material science and engineering, um, renewable energies, uh, pharmaceutical sciences, uh, biomedical or medical technologies, and also entrepreneurship. If we could go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so currently we've got our Year 7 program up and running, and that program is centred around medical devices and medical technologies, and the students are coming in for a three-day program, and they actually get immersed into an experience where they use a framework where they're giving a problem and they have to solve it. And that framework that we use is known as the design thinking process, which I'll touch on in the next slide. Um, our year eight program is currently in development alongside our year nine, and we're hoping we'll get those off um, by mid-year this year. And we'll be focusing on renewable energies at year eight level and um, Gen uh, genomics and genetics at year nine level. Our year 10 program will be looking at actually partnering up with industry and coming up with um, projects for students to get a more of a thorough work experience um, for students that are interested in STEM careers of the future. Um, and for our year 11 and 12 classes, um, we'll be developing um, what we're calling our master classes. Um, which we're still thinking about what that will look like. But we've got our U7 program up and running, which as so far um, we've had some really excited students coming through. Next slide, please. So some of the things that we're using um, to immerse these students in, an, in, in this experience are advanced technologies. And we are allowing them to use things like thermal cameras. We are allowing them to design um, CAD designs that we can then run through CNC milling machines, 3D printers, and also, also laser cutters. Next slide, please. So we're using the design thinking approach, um, and this is a very common um, framework that is being used in engineering firms or designing firms. And we have adapted that framework to work with students. So we're taking a very adult approach, and we are um, we are developing it so, so year seven to ten students can actually learn how that process works and hopefully take those skills into the future. So I'm going to leave it there for now because I'm going to talk a bit about how I've ended up at Monash Tech School um, by beginning at the, right at the start. So I was finishing up my science degree. Um, I had two subjects left for my final semester. And I thought, well, I've got some time. Um, I know I want to do paleontology, but 
there's really not that much paid work in paleontology. I can volunteer my time, and that's cool, but it's not going to pay my bills. So what could I do? I do, definitely did not want to do mining, and I couldn't think of having a fly-in, fly-out job. And so I'd been tutoring um, for the last year or so, and I was really enjoying that interaction and sharing of knowledge with a student and actually seeing the results of that. And I thought, well, <laughs> Could I do something in education? Where do you find these education jobs? Um, and that's when a friend mentioned VSEC, or Victorian Space Science Education Centre, and I asked him, I said, what is this place? I've never heard of it before. And they said, oh, it's a great place. As an educator, you put a suit on, and you get the students to put suits on, you take them to Mars, like you, you know, and you're on a Martian surface, and they do experiments on there, they collect their data, and then they analyze it back in the lab. And I thought, what a great experience. I would love to have the chance to work in a place like that. I mean, how many people could say they've been on Mars? That's awesome. So there I was, application through, got an interview, was shown around, and I was blown away at the fact that there was this education centre that had a hands-on approach around science education and getting students invigorated and excited and inspired about the sciences. And the great thing about VSEC was that it actually aligned with my um, areas of knowledge that I had studied. So aside from geosciences and biology, it also dabbled into a bit of astrophysics um, and a bit of psychology as well. So I could actually draw on those sciences as well um, whilst I was at VSEC. So there I was, as an educator, no formal edu you know, teaching tra uh, teacher training, um, and I was really enjoying the experience. And so I actually decided, well, I'm not just going to be an ed just educator for a title for the day, for the hours I'm there. I actually want to learn about the teaching process. So I started reading into what framework VSEC actually used, and I discovered it was called inquiry-based learning. And it was actually very similar to the scientific method. And being a scientist, I thought, well, I can actually see the connections here. And I can actually draw on my own experiences as a scientist and share that with the students. And I actually found that students really enjoyed having conversations around, outside of just the program, but about the possibilities of what, what they could do. So a couple of years in, and I thought, well, maybe I should start getting the formal training done. And so with a blessing from the director, um, I went off and did my dip ed in 2014. And at the conclusion of 2014, I thought, great, I've got my teaching degree. I've had an experience in, at VSEC um, using inquiry-based learning. How can I challenge myself next? And I started thinking about, well, can I get back into the classroom now? What can I use from my experience there to invigorate students in the classroom? And so I looked around, and there were some opportunities that came up at John Monash. And so I started off there with the Regional Exchange Program. And these were students that are coming in from Regional Victoria to get a STEM experience at a specialist science school. And I actually was able to use the skill set that I had from being a scientist when I wasn't teaching, because um, usually I finished working and I'd get straight into the lab and kept on working on million, 100 million year old fossils. Um, so seeing the, 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 the process of um, students who came through at the lab at Monash um, going through their own projects, I was able to adapt what I'd seen and how I would also teach them certain technical skills and relate it with these students. And these students, for a lot of them, this was a once-in-a-lifetime once experience. So that really got me thinking how you can actually create a learning environment that will inspire your students and how important it is. So, going into a normal classroom setting was very different to what I'd experienced at VSEC. And I also realised that there were certain um, limitations to what you could do, including, you know, schedules, timings, admin, all of that. But that still didn't, 
that still didn't stop me wanting to create an experience that students would love. Around 2016, I decided to go back to uni and do my honours degree and <coughs> absolutely loved the experience. And midway through that, uh, my supervisor asked me to jump on board and help her out with teaching her undergrad unit, since Deakin University doesn't have a dedicated geology degree and therefore they didn't have um, the required uh, staff to actually teach some of the um, content. Um, and luckily enough, um, the content that was being taught actually had direct um, direct connections to my project. So there I was teaching adult learners now and trying to bring my experiences from VSEC and the John Monash Science School and what I'd learned from my teaching course and implementing it at a university level. And what I found was that there, there was a missing element in the structure of teaching um, in demonstrator classes in the sciences there. Um, but that students actually responded really well when I actually, you know, set boundaries all the way. I, you know, directed questions right back at them when they were expecting an answer. So I thought, well, this is fun, but what else can I do? So after doing a stint at um, my old school, um, the Monash Tech School job came up and I applied. Um, and I managed to get the role and I thought this is the next thing for me and what I've learned at the Monash Tech School is that it doesn't really matter what your expertise is necessarily the, jo the jobs of the future require us to extend ourselves and challenge ourselves so could I go to my next slide please thank you so what I'm doing now is I'm working in a slightly different environment, but I'm still using what I've learned from my past experiences as a STEM educator. And I'm now working more as a facilitator, which is slightly different to what I've done in the past. But I'm still challenging myself and I'm still learning and I'm still implementing what I'm learning in my practice. And I think it's really important as educators that we keep doing this cycle of learning and implementation into our practice. So what does that mean for educators or future educators? Next slide. We've got a really fast changing landscape because digital technologies are changing that for us. And so we need to keep up with it. We need to make our practice dynamic. And the only way can we can do that is if we give ourselves the opportunity to chase that learning. So I guess my message to you is don't stop your curiosity or your learning or your yearning for learning something new because it will actually come through your practice and your students will thank you for having a teacher that creates that learning environment and that curiosity for them. So in line with our saying, make it so, I leave it to you to make it so. Thank you very much. We've looked forward to the careers and future. We've looked back at the traditions in the past and we've looked inward at the things that we might have in the journey we change. I'm going to now unleash Georgine Bridgman and she provides a number of STEM programs at engaging students and what I thought was interesting was that she's trying to do it in a way that's scientifically valid technologically advanced, but allow students to investigate and um, identify issues, design and create products and services that benefit the community. She is going to be unleashing STEM on humanity. <coughs> Georgine. 21 years ago I started a company called Acorn Educational Services and we've had the very good fortune of working across all year levels from primary schools right up through year 12 and beyond and into universities as well. One of our programs, I guess all of our programs are based around wanting to help society. One thing that's always interested in me is trying to have programs that students have to put their heart and soul into. All of our programs are inquiry-based learning. We haven't always called them that, but now it's nice that they have a name that makes them more official. Um, 
And one in five people in Australia have a disability of some sort worldwide. Can we change the slide, please? And in, in Australia, that equates to about 4.27 million people. And to address this challenge, and it's only growing because we've got an aging population, so that's going to increase the need of people for more, say, glasses or replacement parts like I have. And it's, it's paramount, it's vital that we teach our students and get them engaged, build the curiosity, build the interest in doing that. So if we can move to the next slide, please. I've been searching, I had a long talk with from last week about a word that says heart and soul. Over the years, I've had the opportunity of working with students when they've designed things either for people with cancer, people with a sight disability, a hearing disability, with students with um, major, major ailments and very severe burn survivors. And the projects that those kids work on, whether they're small children or whether they're up through high school and uni students, they're the projects that have the best outcomes because they could see that they were doing it for other people. And I think it's vital that we make that happen. And I've been looking for that word. Roland gave me a word last week called conative. And I still wasn't quite happy with that word. So I found this word just on the internet the other night. Meriki, I think I'm pronouncing it properly. It's a Greek word. And it means to put your heart and soul and into your cre creativity, into everything you do. And that's where you get the best rewards out, out of it. And that's where the kids certainly get, gain the uh, rewards for themselves. These are just a few examples of some of the programs that we've had where students have had the ability to do that. The, up in the top left hand corner is what was called the ITED. And before there was a lot of coding happening in schools, we had a group of students that learned to do a pickaxe program. And we worked in collaboration with one of the special developmental schools. And what they had asked this team of girls over a five day period was to design a soft toy for very severe, students with very severe autism, young students that could talk for them. They wanted it just to say very basic things like toilet, water, something like that. And at that stage, going back in the early 2010, 2011, there wasn't a lot of that available. So in the five day period, the girls designed the ITED. And then the people that we were working with, our program partner at that stage was a person at BU. They took it away and ruggedized it and put it in the form of a teddy bear. And ITED is still being used today from 2011 at Diamond Valley, S Diamond Valley SDS School. And then here at Monash, we had Professor Kim Cornish ask a group of students if they could design a resource to teach teachers and other people how to teach students that had Fragile X Syndrome. So these girls worked over an extended period of time and they came up with a booklet that's now been recognized by the Fragile X Syndrome societies in the United States, the UK, and in Australia. And it's widely, uh, it's falling off again. Sorry, is this, is this okay? All right, um, and so these girls were year 10 students and they're now pu published authors. And that certainly created an interest in them to go on with the studies in that area. <laughs> Sorry, I get more excited. And one of, one of my favorite projects we've ever worked on is the one in the middle at the bottom. And that was done for an organization called the Kids Foundation. And one of the main jobs of the Kids Foundation is to, port, is to support adolescent burn survivors. And what they wanted was a diary that could take those students on a journey when they first come out of the induced coma they're put in after they're burned and take them right up until they finish their hospitalization. And that book is now available for, through various hospitals. The students got to go to the children's hospital and go through the burns wards. They met several burn survivors and they, they've gone on to support the Kids Foundation as well during various camps. Last year we trialed a program that we called the Full Steam Ahead program. And that program is actually for year 10 students, girls, to try to increase the uptake of girls into the sciences. And in the Full Steam Ahead program, the girls come in, they have to nominate, they do it over their school holidays, so they have to get themselves into the city every day for five days. They start out by having to use wheelchairs, crutches, walkers, uh, canes and things like that. And then in small teams, they have to come up with a project that they'd like to do, an assistive device or an app or a product of some sort for somebody with a disability. And we take in boxes of stuff, 
I don't know what else to call it, but things from like a makerspace. And they have those opportunities and they have to design. And by Friday, they have a working prototype of their projects. And we've now run three of those programs. Um, and the kids that do that, they have that feeling inside them. They've done it for other people. We bring people along that have the disability so they can witness some of the um, examples of the products they're designing for them. Okay, maybe the next slide. And these are just some more examples of some of the projects the kids in full steam ahead have done. And the one down in the bottom right hand corner was called an All Abilities Art Aid. We had somebody come in and talk to him from one of the SDS schools and telling the girls how important it was when you're teaching somebody with a disability, they use a lot of artwork and a lot of writing or painting, coloring. And a lot of the students don't have the ability to use their arms. So this particular group actually designed and 3D printed an arm a prosthetic type arm that could be fitted onto somebody's arm so they could actually use writing and painting implements. So it's just amazing. And that's, that's what gets me excited is when we can do things like that. Can we move to the next slide? We trialed it with some primary students as well. And you saw the example of the one little, the two kids that were talking about the, the leg rider that, and, that they designed. And that, again, was done with just stuff that was taken into the schools. They had to use the mobility aids as well. And that, that was designed to fit on a stump of a leg, and that would ride a bicycle. And I guess what, the one thing Roland wanted me to do is to challenge you to unleash the STEM in your own classrooms. And I would encourage you to get community partners involved. Let the students be involved with actually designing things that are made for somebody else. If you do that, the kids do put their heart and soul in it. They take it to heart. They're proud of what they do. So we've worked with a lot of, a lot of different schools now, schools groups that are working with project-based learning programs. And again, we always bring in trying to do something for people with disabilities. So I'd just like to challenge all of you to see how you can make that happen. I'm just going to invite uh, Rob to give us a reflection on the uh, four different streams. Now, I should introduce uh, Rob. Rob has been uh, teaching science in, since 1975. He became a member of the Science Teachers Association Victoria in 1976 and joined the committee in 1981. He was a science talent search director for over almost a decade and staff president from 1996 to 1998. In 1988, after 13 years of teaching, he was seconded to Melbourne University as a lecturer in teacher education, completing his PhD in 2006 at the Melbourne Graduate School of Education. Robert's a founding member and secretary of the Magnet Online Association of STEM Educators. Some of them are actually outside with the uh, makerspace. And his research interests include student managed learning in STEM education, pedagogies in support of STEM education, and teacher learning. Rob. Thank you, Roland. <clears throat> uh, firstly, what I'd like to do is thank the uh, the, the four presenters, I think they've done an excellent job in setting the scene for a shift in the way in which we might have been considering what STEM education is about. We're exploring STEM education and we're also exploring a relationship with the maker movement. And for many of us who may have come from a science back, uh, background, we have found that um, there's some issues that we need to resolve in terms of feeling comfortable with moving into this space called STEM, because it's, um, uh, it's not an easy thing for us to understand. And I think that the uh, examples that have been um, provided for us today will help us, uh, when we discuss them and talk through them, will help us understand a little bit better what the problems are that people have in relation to this thing called STEM. Now, on the first slide, I've got um, a, a reference to juggling perspectives and connecting dots. So I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more in a minute. Now, I've got an image of some babushka dolls. Now, the reason why I've got the babushka dolls there is because STEM, it sounds like a noun, but in actual fact, we know it's an acronym, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And so as a babushka doll, they're all things that could be inside. And so as you pull the dolls out, you're pulling out various aspects of STEM. Or another way of looking at STEM 
is a series of babushka dolls where STEM, they talk about STEM as an enterprise. So it's not just about the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It then becomes education, STEM education, STEM research, STEM entrepreneurship. So there's a lot of things associated with STEM. And on the other part of my slide, I've got a cat looking at a ball of wool. Now, the ball of wool could be a representative of your ideas. Nicely, neatly put together. You've been teaching for a period of time. You understand what you're doing with STEM. And then this cat comes along and sees just a little thread, plays with it a little bit, and your world that you thought was you had together starts to unravel. Or it could be that you're the person who's the cat and your, your teachers that you work with have a neatly nice picture of what they think STEM or school teaching should be, whether it's at the primary level or secondary level, and then you start to pull on the string. You might be a leader in your community, or you might just be a person who's got a few ideas and you want to throw them around. So we're, in a sense, setting up the discussion, the conversation, so that we can look at many different perspectives. Not necessarily saying that any one is correct, but looking at many of them. So if you go to the next slide, um, what I've got on the next slide is the general picture that we often have of science. And the general picture of science is that it's some way for us to um, <clears throat> understand our natural world. And it's, it does have technology in there, it's got the telescope, but that's a special piece of technology, a bit of apparatus, experimental technology, so that we can extend our eyesight to see further about the natural, the natural world. On the other hand, I've got an image there of people just going about their normal life, and we all do it every weekend or even during the 24 hours a day, we have to eat. We have to, in a sense, uh, live in this world. And that part of it is the consumer part of the world. And if you notice very carefully, I'm not sure you can see, but um, mobile phone in one hand, bottle of olive oil in the other hand. Now, we don't know what's going to happen there, whether they're checking the ingredients, ringing someone, is this the right? But that's the world that we live in. But it's not part of the curriculum. Normally, what's part of the curriculum is the science side, the natural world, but not the world, the human world that we've created. We've designed it, we've engineered it. So that's two perspectives and two images. You can have different images, different perspectives, but I'm just saying it's part of the conversation. Now, when you look at the, um, the ideas that um, uh, Renee, Donna, Hava and Georgine provided for us, they were not necessarily dealing with the natural world. They were dealing with a hybrid world. Part of it has related to knowledge and, and skills that we've taken from our understanding of the natural world and we've then included it into our human world, the designed world. Now, if you, if you look at um, Renee's work, she was looking at um, jobs, jobs for the future, um, computerisation, digitalisation, the kind of cyber space, cyber area. So if you go to the second slide now, uh, sorry, the third slide, um, in this one I've got a picture of a book and a picture of, it's not really a picture, it's just a, a mock-up, but it's representing a cyber equivalent of the book. The book we could see as um, 1.0 STEM, and we could say this digital kind of is becoming more like the 4.0 STEM. So there's some changes that are going on. Now, what I'm trying to contrast there is in terms of pedagogy, there was a time when we relied on textbooks as being not only the place where people can find information, but it was true information. In the cyber world, you may not be able to find the information. There may be wikis, blogs, all kinds of different places. And then we have to have some new skills, what to do with it. So it becomes a political space. So if you like, if we look at Donna, Donna was looking at an issue in relation to archiving 
history. Now, it's a political question. It's also a question which relates to um, what information the student's going to be able to access. We used to have librarians and we used to have books that uh, we'd agree approved of in our school libraries and then there would be uh, access made by teachers and students. Online, different issues. But what Donna is pointing to is that there's another issue of what actually, who makes the decisions and what actually is in the archive. Now, we will need to look at it in the, school, in the school context. What information do we archive in a digital sense? Do we archive students' work? Do we archive teachers' work? Is there a repository of student literature, student materials that have been archived for future students to access, rather than always accessing either adult work or um, polished work, which is of a commercial level. So there's another issue that we might want to consider when we're considering STEM. So if we just go to the next, the next slide, which is uh, my final slide, I've got someone juggling, and I'm saying juggling STEM perspective. That's what we're all doing here. We don't know, it's not settled, and if you, um, Harva, Harva was explaining her journey, her journey from scientist to educator. Now, many of us have made that journey. We make, we're always making journeys. Students will be making journeys. But we don't know what life's going to be like in five or 10 or 20 years' time, or what job is going to be available. Now, Harva probably didn't know that the job that she's got today was going to be available. Now, so let's not worry too much about that issue of 40% jobs and things. They're, they're issues for others to think about. We have a different task. Our task is to try and understand what we're going to do uh, in our classrooms, given that we have been given a mandate to teach the students, and we've been given a curriculum, but the curriculum and the mandate doesn't equal the activities you do in the classroom. They're things that you have to come to terms with, you and other members of your um, school community. So what I'm saying is, just finally, oh, no, I haven't. Uh, I'm not going to forget Georgina. Georgina is great, because what she's helping us understand is that STEM is not just about the able-bodied world. It's not just about the things that ordinary people can have access to, and if there's anything left over or anything that be, can be re uh, purposed, maybe it might help someone who's got a disability. STEM, in terms of the manufacturing, engineering, technology, should have a role to play, not just in jobs, creating jobs, but helping people live their life in the world that's been created, and sometimes the world's been created, which disadvantages people with disability. Anyway, that's the politics of the soap opera thing. But the point is, um, we have to juggle things, and then we have to make connections join the dots, and that's something that we do as a community together, and Roland is standing here ready. <laughs> and I think I've covered the things that I think that we can um, make use of from your experiences and uh, uh, what you bring to the schools you, ha you offer. This is a partnership. So it's schools, there's a partnership with people who are very passionate about STEM type activities, and then there is um, other support mechanisms that are out there, which is you yourself. You as, as part of your teacher associations or part of your community groups or activities like this where we can have a discussion and share ideas. Thank you very much. <laughs> Give you a big hand. It's easy to get caught up with the glossy, glitzy toys. It's easy to get caught up with the frustrations of some of the technology that might be driving you down or holding you back or preventing you from moving on. What's exciting for me is to reconnect with the passion, the love, and why we're doing this, solving real world problems to make the world a better place to live in. I'd like to thank all of our guest speakers for having uh, worked here tonight and, and also for the team who've been doing the presentation. Um, I'd like to uh, draw a close for tonight, invite you to step into the maker space and make something and help make it so. But lastly, I'd like you to leave your footprint on this room. Um, you have some of the tables here, whiteboard markers. I'd encourage you to graffiti the table with a nice message of thank you to the crew here. Um, it's an exciting
room, an exciting space, and thank you very much for coming along tonight. Now, we do have something coming up. Next slide. Now, that's okay. Keep going. We actually have a, another STEM seminar that will be coming up. So this is part of our series. It's the first. And the next one, I believe, will be on the... 17th of May. 17th of May. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.